Thank you all for being here. Uh, appreciate your coverage of this. This is the most important thing to the House Republicans and the most important thing to the American people. Uh, today, President Biden is going to Brownsville, Texas, to see the crisis at the border. Um, it's disheartening to know that uh, with the way the public, the, the American people will, you know, look at this and say, okay, so President Trump decides he's going to go down to the border, so two or three days later, President Biden decides to go down to the border. That is what the American people will take from this. And uh, it's disheartening to know that that is the case from what we've seen with the emphasis that our president has put on uh, this crisis. Um, given the devastating crisis that has unfolded at our border and seeped into communities, this should not be the president's it shouldn't be only his second visit to the border. This should have been all over. He should have been all over this the last three years. Uh, I think a very important aspect to recognize is also the political um, play here for President Biden. Brownsville can hardly be considered one of the most challenging immigration areas. Per the CBP, it is the 29th busiest Border Patrol station this month with far less activity than San Diego, Tucson, and El Paso sectors. The American people can see through that. Since, since President Biden took office, there have been 8.7 million illegal crossings nationwide and over 7.2 illegal crossings at our southern border. There are eight common sense executive actions that President Biden could take to address this crisis at the border that happened under his watch. Our speaker has articulated those. You all have that information from end catch and release, reinstate uh, remain in Mexico, down to use expedited removal and taxpayer-funded benefits for illegal aliens. It's eight very simple things that President Biden could do today to help alleviate the cartels from being able to run the border the way they are. As we saw with the tragic death of Lake and Riley last week at the University of Georgia, negligent immigration policies threaten the safety of our communities. House Republicans have remained committed to addressing our border crisis by passing HR2, by constantly communicating about this, by constantly going and being at the border and showing the American people the tragedy and the, uh, and the crisis that is going on. Um, this bill, HR2, all the provisions within it are the strongest border security that, we've, that, that, that the, House, uh, the, the U.S. House has ever put together. It is past time the Biden administration takes real steps to end this crisis seriously uh, rather than stage these types of photo ops that we'll see today. We continue to work on behalf of the American people towards these solutions. We've got uh, a great uh, group of members and leadership to, to, to share their perspective with you. I will now turn the mic over to Representative Beth Van Dyne from Texas. Thank you very much. We continue to see this Biden administration completely give away our country. Whether or not that's through small things like the SBA programs that we're now having to force through legislation, a bill that I'm very happy is going to be hopefully on the floor for a vote this week, that we can actually have whistleblowers have an ease of way on the SBA's website to talk about the $200 million that we've given away to fraudsters, to people from other countries who are taking advantage of our country, of our bills, of a weak administration. We continue to see this, but nowhere do you see it clearer than what's happening at our border today? You want to talk about giving away our country. From day one, this president had all of the tools on his desk to be able to maintain our secure border. And what did he do from day one? Immediately, he stopped work on the border wall. Immediately, he started directing HMS instead of actually having Homeland Security do its job. No, they became cab drivers. The border became a bus stop where people could come illegally, get picked up, and be brought to a plane or a, a, a bus to be shipped to other places around our country. Mr. President, you're down at the border now for a photo op. Your policies have led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans. How many more Lake and, Lake and Rileys are we going to have? Lake and Riley, a 22-year-old nursing student who was murdered by a Venezuelan illegal immigrant who should never have been in this country. Lake and Riley's middle name, by the way, was Hope. You've taken away her hope. You've taken away her family's hope. And you're down there right now for a photo op. Your policies that you took off the table, such as the Remain in Mexico, where, those, where that Venezuelan would never have been allowed in the country because he would have been stopped at the border and sent back to the first safe country or remained in Mexico until his asylum claim was filed. You took away the rights 
of Immigration and Customs Enforcement to be able to get rid of criminal illegal aliens that were committing crimes within our country. What did you put in its place? Catch and release. Catch and release was great because what that did was it allowed everybody in. Over 10 million illegal immigrants have come into our country since you've been in office. Thousands of pounds of fentanyl have been allowed to enter into our country, killing over 110,000 Americans, five Texans each day. You have the power to be able to stop it now. You have the ability, the policies that were there when you got into office, to be able to stop this problem, and you haven't done it. Instead, you are down on our border for a photo op. Mr. President, how many more daughters, how many more sons, how many more children, how many more of us will you have to kill before you will take this seriously? Unless you were willing to get down on the border and tell Lakin Riley's family, I am sorry, this is my responsibility, and I'm going to fix it now. You have no business being president. Our country deserves better. And hopefully in November, we will get it. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Today, as uh, Representative Van Dyne just uh, reminded us, President Biden is heading to the border for what I am confident will be another cleaned up photo op. While Joe Biden is busy making empty promises at our border, the rest of the country is being forced to deal with the consequences of his neglect. At this point, we all know the numbers. There have been 8.7 million illegally, illegal crossings nationwide. That doesn't even include the known gotaways since Joe Biden took office. Uh, this is what we know of. The president also knows the numbers and still does nothing to protect innocent Americans from this invasion. So now we need to talk about the people. We need to talk about the real-life victims of Biden's border failures. We need to talk about the two-year-old who was fatally shot earlier this month. We need to talk about the 14-year-old girl in Louisiana who was raped. And we need to talk about Lake and Hope Riley, who went for a run on her college campus and never came home. The alleged perpetrators in each of these attacks, illegal immigrants. These are just a few of the innocent Americans who have been victimized because of Joe Biden's open border policies. I know I've said it before, but enough is enough. I've had enough. Our majority has had enough. The American people have had enough. The question remains, how many innocent people have to suffer for it to be enough for Joe Biden to say it's enough and take action? The time for photo ops is over. The time for action is now. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our great majority leader, Steve Scalise. Well, thank you, Whip Emmer. As President Biden goes down to the border today for a photo op, as been aptly pointed out, he has the authority today to fix this problem that he created. And let's go back to his first day in office. Joe Biden, with a pen, undid the policies that President Trump had in place that were working. Remain in Mexico was a negotiated agreement between our two countries. You know, when Joe Biden says, oh, it's hard because, boy, Mexico doesn't want to do it. Mexico didn't want to get into the agreement when President Trump was in office. But President Trump made it abundantly clear to the president of Mexico why it was important to happen. And ultimately, it did happen. And Remain in Mexico stopped a lot of that illegal flow. Ending catch and release was something else President Trump did that worked effectively. Joe Biden reversed that policy on his own. There were no laws passed to do that. And it seemed like he, you know, maybe forgot that he had that legal authority for a while. Speaker Johnson actually pointed it out to the president on multiple occasions that he has the legal authority today to fix this problem. Now, we took our own action in the House. We came together as House Republicans to say we are going to fix this problem and show the country how you can secure the border. When we passed H.R. 2, a critical piece of legislation that combined all the different elements that we gathered as we worked with Border Patrol agents and other experts that know what's at stake to say let's fix this problem. It's a shame that not a single Democrat voted for that bill because they're not serious about the problem. They don't want to fix the problem. 
But then when you look at what happened just a few days ago with Lake and Riley, that really woke the country up to just how bad this is. And sadly, in my backyard in Kenner, Louisiana, as the whip pointed out, a 14-year-old girl was raped by someone here illegally just days ago. This is happening over and over again in communities all across America, and people are rightfully outraged. Not just because it's happening, but because it's preventable. Because it was created by Joe Biden, and Joe Biden doesn't want to fix the mess he created. So he'll go down to the border. I don't know what he'll say. He might talk about taking action. Well, Mr. President, we've shown you the steps you can take. I'll give you a question you can ask the White House today. If the president dares say that he really wants to secure the border, but won't take the steps that we've been talking about today, ask President Biden why today he's still got a lawsuit against the governor of Texas, who's trying to secure his own state's border because the president won't do his job. So Governor Abbott put up some razor wire to at least give some protection to the state of Texas to stop the flow of illegals coming in. And you would think Joe Biden would applaud him and say, hey, you know, I know the president's not doing his job, but thank you for at least doing something. No, President Biden is in court today trying to force Governor Abbott to take that barrier down so that more illegals can come in. So clearly Joe Biden wants more illegals to come into this country. So whatever he says at the border today, he should be asked, Mr. President, are you going to drop your lawsuit against the state of Texas so that they can at least protect their border if you won't take the necessary actions to do it? We in the House have continued to stand for border security and pass legislation, even without a single Democrat vote, because we care about this problem. And we're going to continue to fight for those families who are sick and tired of an open southern border. And the man at the front of that fight has been our speaker every step of the way. Uh, leading that charge, Mike Johnson. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, uh, Blake, and Beth, and Tom, and, and all of you for being here. Uh, it's another busy week on Capitol Hill. There's a lot going on. Let me give you a couple updates. On um, on Tuesday, I, I went to the White House and met with the President, the Vice President, uh, leaders Schumer and McConnell, and uh, Hakeem Jeffries, my counterpart in the House. I told him the obvious truth. The obvious truth is very simple. You've heard it repeated here multiple times this morning. We hear it all over the country. I've been in multiple states over the last week, uh, all over the country. The obvious truth is that we have to take care of America's needs first. We have to. The border is the issue to every American, no matter where they live, no matter where their state is, because every state's a border state. If we're going to take care of America's needs first, that means two things. It means securing the border. I would repeat it ten times for emphasis, but you understand what we're saying here. We have to secure the border. We have to do it. And we got to fund our government. And so this week, we're, we're working very hard to do both of those things. We're trying to urge the president to use his executive authority to do something meaningful to stop the hemorrhaging at the border, stop the flow, reduce the flow. At the White House, I talked to him about this specifically. I reiterated to him the specific provisions of the federal law that give him broad authority to do that, to unwind the extraordinary, unprecedented damage that he has done with his policies. This is a catastrophe of their design. As was mentioned earlier, Vice Chairman uh, Blake Moore said at the Republican conference that we, we documented 64 specific actions beginning on the day he took the office of executive orders and agency orders and actions that opened that border wide and created this chaos. And everybody in America knows it. Everybody knows the president has authority to do something, and he won't. And I cannot understand why he won't. So I pleaded with him to do that. Meanwhile, we're getting the funding, uh, government funding piece done as well. Uh, I wish we could say um, the same about that border security. Uh, the president's going to the border. You've heard for his – this is only his second visit in three years. With everything going on, as bad as it is, as the statistics are as horrible, catastrophic as they are, the effects in every community, he's only seen fit to go twice. And he's going for a photo op, as you said, to Brownsville, which is the 29th-ranked hotspot on the border. Why would he go to the 29th-ranked hotspot? Because he doesn't really want to see the reality. We tried to explain it to him. The National Border Patrol Council themselves called President Biden's visit, quote, too little, too late. I think that's an understatement. Also today, former President Trump is visiting Eagle Pass. That's where I led a group of 64 House Republicans on January 3rd. It was the largest congressional trip ever. Many of us have been down to the border many times, but that was the largest group to go together. And, and the side-by-side -side image of these two presidents could not be a greater contrast. One president was building a wall, 
President Trump. He was cracking down on those trying to cross the border illegally. He was supporting our CBP agents. He used his executive authority to stop illegal immigration. And the current president, Biden, is doing exactly the opposite of all those things. He stopped construction on the wall. He halted deportations. He ceded operational control to the cartels and the traffickers. And he did everything he could to incentivize, incentivize illegal immigration. Long story short, one president showed strength and the other showed weakness. I mean, that's just what it is. One president stood for control. The other stood for chaos at the border. So House Republicans, meanwhile, are continuing to fight for strength and control. We want to keep criminals out and our families safe. And that's what the American people want. They demand that. They deserve it from the Congress. That's why we're pushing for enforcement of the laws. Last week, Lake and Riley, of course, we all know, the UGA nursing student, tragically killed by an illegal immigrant from Venezuela, came across that border, released to New York under asylum laws. He committed multiple crimes. He wasn't deported, and he went on to take Lakin's life brutally. Uh, that story is being repeated across the country, communities all across the country, and it sadly, tragically, unnecessarily will continue, we fear. Multiple other vulnerable Americans have been victimized just in the last week by illegal immigrants, many of them minors. And don't forget, every week, 22 kids per week die from drug overdoses. The overwhelming majority of those are from fentanyl poisoning. Fentanyl, as we all know, we repeat here almost weekly, is the leading cause of death for Americans age 18 to 49. Some say those are just anecdotes. I say it's the result, the completely foreseeable result, of Biden's open borders and catch and release policy. It has to end. As I told President Biden during our meeting on Tuesday, he needs to take executive action right now. He needed to take it yesterday and the day before. He needs to secure that border and protect our communities because lives are being lost and we cannot wait. And, and with that, um, we'll, we'll open up for a few questions. Good Chad. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. You've talked a lot about just how small your majority is, especially if you try to get an agreement on the spending bill here. If you have consistently stuck your guns on HR2, are you being too strident when it comes to HR2 when there are other border security measures which could be passed? It's, it's, a, it's a really important question, and I'll, and I'll say this again. It, it doesn't matter to me what you call the legislation. The H.R. 2 was the measure that we passed, what, 11 months ago, right? It's the components of H.R. 2 that matter. If the president, for example, uh, announces today, which we don't expect, that he'll take some sort of executive action, and he says, hey, I'm going to do a little bit on the asylum reform, that is not going to solve the problem. The reason the components of H.R. 2 are so important is because you need, they're like interlocking pieces. You need multiple pieces of this or you will not stop the flow. I remind you again, when we were down at Eagle Pass on January 3rd, 64 Republicans, House Republicans, we had leaders, I mean, 30-plus year veterans of, of Border Patrol, of the agency, and they told us they're being asked to administer an open fire hydrant. They don't need more buckets. They need to reduce the flow. How do you reduce the flow? Chad, the, the, the answer is simple. You reinstate Remain in Mexico. That alone would reduce the flow by 70 percent. That's their estimate. I told the president that of the White House again. He acted as though he had never heard that, didn't understand it, said he couldn't do it. I said, that's not true. Well, I don't, uh, I don't, Mexico doesn't want that. Mr. President, we're the United States. Mexico will do what we say, okay? President Trump did it. Wh why can't you do it? Remain in Mexico, then you end catch and release. The reason we have violent criminals who we know are violent criminals free-ranging around the country and, and uh, uh, committing these atrocities is because they have been released. They have been turned loose into the country. This is happening every single day. So you end catch and release. You do need reforms to asylum and the parole process, and you need to build some wall, right? You can pick and choose among the menu, but if you don't have key components, you're not going to solve the problem. We don't need photo ops, and we don't need political talking points. We need to solve the problem. We need to stop the flow. And that's why we're so insistent and doggedly determined to get those provisions through. We're looking at all options, every option, and we're going to continue to press this and work on it every day, single day. As I said, I'm not wed to H.R. 2. It's the components that are going to fix it. That is the problem. Wait, wait, hang on. Let me, I need to go to the back. I never go to the back. Middle, back here. Yes, sir. Yeah, so look, the appropriation, appropriations process is, is ugly. Democracy is ugly. Um, this is the way it works every year, always has, except that we've instituted some new innovations. We broke the omnibus fever, right? That's how Washington has been run for years. We're, we're, we're trying to turn the aircraft carrier back 
to real budgeting and spending reform. This was an important thing, to break it up into smaller pieces. We've been working on uh, separate individual appropriations bills, 12 appropriations bills. The, our, our appropriations committee and the, the cardinals, who are, as you know, the, the chairs of the subcommittees of appropriations, have had hands on the wheel. All the uh, members and staff have been working around the clock. They have been for weeks to get this done. Uh, and we were able to uh, have that innovation to break it up. So what we're doing is it, by having the laddered CR approach, and the laddered approach is that you have separate uh, tranches of bills instead of one big omnibus that nobody can read or understand or have a process in. This has been a long, deliberate process. The House, as you know, passed 80 percent of our bills through the House. Eighty percent of federal funding came through the, the House. The Senate passed three bills, right? We did. The House did our work. Most of them made their way all the way through committee, the other, the other remaining four bills. Um, so members did have a say. They had a, a process in that. When it gets down to the final negotiation of the final provisions in each of them, that's a smaller subset of members because it's complicated and complex. But that bill text is going to be posted this weekend. All of our members will have 72 hours to review it. That's our commitment. That's our rule. We're respecting it. And that's the only reason we need the process CR to allow us time to do that. If I did it the way, I don't know, Speaker Pelosi did, we just drop that bill and vote on it within hours, right? We're not going to do that. We want members to be able to have their review and their say and to see all of that. Um, it's been a long road to get here. Uh, this is a bipartisan agreement in the end, but it sticks to the numbers, uh, the agreement on spending. It does not go above that. It will increase a bit defense spending, but there will be uh, real cuts to uh, non-defense uh, discretionary spending because that's what was agreed upon and that's what we're going to adhere to. The remaining six appropriations bills will be finalized ahead of the March 22nd deadline. And then what I'm very excited about and anxious to do is turn the page on FY24 and get immediately into FY25 and that process to change the way that's done, to, to back it up on the calendar to do everything we can to get that job done by end of summer so that we're not coming up at the end of September, the end of the fiscal year, and having to talk about, you know, CRs and omnibuses and everything. We're gonna, we are going to do everything we can to turn that aircraft carrier around, and we're going to try to make it happen. Very bad. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, of course they did. But they the, remember, the Senate took four months to put, try to put a bill together to do that, okay? We've had their bill for a week and a half. Um, the, the House is actively considering options on a path forward, but our first responsibility is to fund the government. And, and, our, and our primary overriding responsibility has been for the last three years is to secure the border. And so we're, we're getting the government funding done, and then we're going to turn to these other priorities. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. But we've made very clear when the President first came out with his National Security Supplemental Bill, he had four components in it, right? He had border, Ukraine, Israel, and Indo-Pacific. And the reason there were four components is because even the White House deemed that to be important. We said, you're right. But among those things, if we're going to fix everything around the world, we've got to fix America first. We've got to focus on America's security. And I don't think there's an American out there who disagrees with that. There, it is inexcusable. The president has not taken action on the border, and we're going to continue to insist on that uh, every single day. Last, last, last question. Front row. Yeah. Red coat. How about that? All right. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, happy Thursday, Touch Friday. Uh, there are obviously many critical issues in American life that we all are debating and discussing. On IVF, do you favor a bill to protect IVF, and do you believe discarding embryos is murder? Um, look, I believe in the sanctity of, of every human life. I always have. And because of that, I support IVF and its availability. If you look at the, the statistics, it's really an amazing thing. Since the technology became available in, I think, the 70s, maybe the mid-70s, an estimated 8 million births uh, in the U.S. Uh, have been brought about because of that technology. I have – Kelly and I have uh, many close friends who – have had trouble with fertility issues, and they, they've, they've had beautiful families as a result of IVF. And so it needs to be readily available. It needs to be something that every American supports, and uh, it needs to be uh, handled in an ethical manner. Um, so we'll continue to support that. I, I don't think there's a single person uh, in the Republican conference who disagrees with that statement, and there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about it, but it's something I think we ought to support. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much.